All right, guys, we are live. I'm super pumped up because tonight I'm with a rock star in the mobile home industry. And I know you guys hear me talk a lot about mobile home park investing, but Kelvin Ahia here has mastered the business of the home side. And so as a community owner, this has seriously attracted me because one challenge that we have as mobile home park operators all the time is filling vacant lots, right? And selling homes, that whole part of our business, it's very clunky. So what I did is I said, who's the, who's the best guy to teach us how to fill up our communities? And so I went to Calvin and said, hey, would you do something with me? And so we've done a couple of collaborative things right now or, or lately. And uh, I know you guys are going to get a ton of value out of this. So stick around till the end. I'm covering all bases. We're going to talk to the mobile home investors, want to be mobile home investors. And we're going to definitely talk to the mobile home park owners and want to be owners and how all this comes together. So we all make money together. So stick around, Calvin, dude, thanks for being on, man. I really appreciate it. I know that you've got a ton of value for these guys, so I'm going to pull it out of you. Okay. <laughs> hey, let's go. Let's go. So Calvin's Calvin's a pro and he's doing this all over the country, which is what makes it really interesting. He's not doing it just in his own backyard. He's doing this all over the place. And that means it's very scalable. And it's something that we as community owners and you also as mobile home investors can do anywhere in the country. So Calvin, let's start out. I know you're in Louisiana, but how'd you get into uh, mobile home investing to start? Like, what were you doing? Like, what made you crazy enough to be in this industry? <laughs> I ended up here by accident. I was, it was not, I was not supposed to be a mobile home guy, right? Uh, so yeah, so a little backstory on me. Um, I'll take it back to uh, back in 2010. Uh, I was working for a company that was getting ready to sell, go out of business, and it was time for a career change for me. I'm probably mid 30s at the time, and um, looking for career path. Right, wasn't sure what I was going to get into. I've always been in some type of sales or management position most of my adult life, and um, decided that um, well, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad is what happened. Yeah. Right. And and uh, that was kind of the you know, that was kind of the start of everything. So um, I started, you know, my original plan was that I was going to be a house flipper, HGTV guy, flip homes, make a bunch of money. And that was going to be my path. Right. And um, a long story short, it didn't work out that way. Um, I ended up partnering with a buddy of mine that was going that was also selling his company and he was going through a similar career change. And he ended up asking me one day what I was, what my plans were. And I said, I'm going to get into real estate. And he said, oh, you're going to, you're going to get your real estate license. And I said, no, I'm going to flip houses. And the first thing he told me was, you know, like what, well, like, how are you going to do that? Like he was one, like, you got money that I don't know about or, and I said, well, no, I've been studying. And I said, apparently um, there's this thing called OPM and it's called other people's money I've been reading about. And it's basically people that have money that they want to put to work. Right. And they want to grow their money and they may not have the time or, or uh, to get out there and grind deals, but they're willing to, you know, to invest in, in projects. And and uh, that's how I plan on doing it. So he ends up telling me, he says, well, where do you find this, this, this money, these people? I said, apparently, from what I'm reading, they're everywhere. <laughs> could be the guy could be the guy at church, could be the guy, your neighbor could be, uh, you know, a guy at the gas station you have a conversation with and could be anybody, you know, could be your uncle. Um, and it's just a matter of having conversations. And he says, oh, OK. A couple of weeks later, he tells me, hey, man, I, I think because uh, he wanted to do it with me, he said, you know, if, if you don't mind. And so we decided to partner up. A couple of weeks later, he comes back and tells me, he said, hey, man, I found some private money, uh, the private money you were talking about. And I said, really? He said, yeah, my wife was speaking to a guy at church, a friend of ours. He's a retired oil field CEO, some big company. He's got some money, just like you said, and he's, he's you know, he's willing to. To, to invest. So that's what started it. We ended up doing one deal um, and I'll keep it short here. We flipped the house together using, using that uh, private money. Uh, it took way longer than we expected, cost more than we, than we budgeted for. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we didn't make as much money as we thought we were, um, which is really difficult because we're both married with kids and, you know, and people relying on us. And, um, Important thing is we were able to pay the investor back what we what we owed. So that was the most important thing to us. But at the end of the day, we didn't make any money, right? Very little. Um, walked away with some with some change, but not at all what we expected. 
So that led both of us to go back in, into the work field, right? We took some time off. It was a really rough year trying to figure this out. And uh, we went back to work. Um, I actually became, I, I worked for, uh, was a regional manager for Planet Fitness here in Louisiana, right? So that's what I ended up doing. I got it back into management. Uh, we had nine health clubs in the state of Louisiana. So that was, I was in charge, in charge of that. Um, but I always wanted to get back into real estate, get back in investing. Always knew that, you know, having a job was just a temporary fix. I had to pay my bills. But the whole thing was like, how was I going to get back? How was I going to get into it? Right. And between 2010 to about 2012, 2013, um, I started studying everything. Right. All the ex whatever time after work and everything. I'm on bigger pockets. I'm on the Internet. I'm talking to people. And um, what ends up happening, I guess, is what we call in the industry analysis paralysis. Yeah. Right? I started studying too everything. many deals and not doing anything. Yes. <laughs> I was I felt like I was really busy and taking action, but I just wasn't getting any traction because all I was doing was researching. And I'm the type of person that everything's a great idea. Right. And it's always the next best thing. So whether I started learning about real estate and getting deals through foreclosures. And then I learned about tax sales. So I pivoted to that and everything that came across me, I was, I was interested in. And the truth is, is I'd never really got anything off the ground and it was really difficult. Looking back now, I think um, probably one of the biggest factors is I didn't understand the power of relationships and networking. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't have the resources. I didn't have the network to, you know, to, to, to get over the edge. So I, I stayed, you know, I worked and then, um, I would say, you know, after 2000, I would say 2011, somewhere right after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a buddy of mine from high school uh, convinced me to go to a local real estate meetup here. It's my first time ever attending. And the speaker went over a lot of strategies, one of them being wholesaling real estate. Right. And it always stuck in my head. I just thought, wow, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's that's amazing. Like, I really love the concept and I thought thought it was great. But again, everything looked great to me. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, shiny so, object syndrome, right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so anyway, I'm working, you know, I'm working at Planet Fitness and I'm still looking, still searching for the answer. And I ended up coming across some mobile homes, right? Um, and started looking into that. And as I started to look at it, I mean, it just kind of made sense. I saw it as a as a a temporary fix, right? To help me get into the game where there was a lower cost of entry, you know, into it. There was a tons of uh, demand and a lot of houses out there. So I just saw it um, and decided that I was going to take a deeper look into it. And that's that's kind of how I got my start. I started talking to park owners, um, looking for deals. And my first ever mobile home deal was, I call it a deal. I shouldn't call it a deal. Um, I ended up finding a free mobile home in a park, uh, talking to the park owner. And it was a mobile home that was supposed to, she wanted it moved because she gave it to her daughter. Her daughter was supposed to fix it up and rent it out and it never happened. And so she kind of like got fed up and said, listen, you either do something with it or it's out of here. I need my lot rent. Right. And so the daughter didn't do anything. And she ended up, um, I can't remember if I saw it on Facebook or Craigslist somewhere. She posted it for sale or actually it was free to whoever could move it first. Yeah. So I went over there and, and I, you know, I had a conversation with her and convinced her to allow me to leave it there if I could fix it up and get a, you know, get a tenant or resell it or whatever. And she ended up, she ended up saying, okay. Right. So that was my first, my first try. Free, free, right. You got, free the, you got it free, free. Doesn't have you guys to hear that? Hold on. Let me, let me pause you really quick. He picked up a home for zero dollars. <laughs> okay. You can't do that in the single family world. Keep going. Well, look, so, so we, okay. It's free home. Doesn't have to be moved. Park owner is what today we call investor friendly, right? She's okay with me renting it out. If I wanted to sell or finance it, whatever I wanted to do with it uh, or flip it, she was cool with it. She just wanted her lot rent and she even gave me a couple months free. So today, like that's the ideal scenario. That's what every mobile home investor and flipper and wholesaler is looking for. And I was able to, you know, to find that. So, you know, it's kind of like you look at it and the question is like, how can you mess? How can you screw that up? Right. What could go wrong? Well, everything <laughs> went wrong. Everything right? went wrong. And the short version is I had no experience in, 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 you know, repairs or anything. I didn't have a background in it. 
I didn't know how to estimate work. I didn't know how to hire handymen or anything like that or how to vet them. All the things looking back now. And I I, uh, I make a joke of it today. I say that um, I took Tony Robbins advice and I just took action, massive action. Right. And I got myself in a bind is what happened. Yeah. Um, I had no idea um, how much it would cost to rewire a mobile home like that oh, in geez. itself. Right. So to go over the numbers, um, I ended up I actually ended up partnering with uh, with my sister and my brother in law who came in and they had like five thousand dollars is what they loaned me. And I had a handyman off of Craigslist come by and, uh, you know, and, and do a little repair estimate. Of course, being a newbie and not knowing what I was doing, I just told him, I said, look, I've got 5K to spend on this. Like, what do you think it's going to cost? And the guy tells me, oh, I can do it for 5K. I said, okay, great. <laughs> that didn't work out. Right? That's a red flag. <laughs> Second day on the job, um, I go and check on the project. And, you know, after I get off of work and he walks up to me and, and uh, I mean, he's probably about 20 feet away from me and I can smell the liquor on him. And he's, he's nice. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up firing him on that day i told him not to come back and everything got back on craigslist took the next guy that that said he was going to come out he came out worked on the home a couple um couple weeks and then quit on me i just no showed and then i hired the next crew and basically it was i mean it, the whole home i mean come to find out it had mold in it it was just just a bunch of stuff it was full with trash and then as we started digging all of the insulation was wet so we had to rip that out and then we find out that the whole home had to be rewired, which I had no idea how much, you know, I had no idea how much, how expensive that was. Um, at the end of the day, 5,000 turned into 11,000, right? So 5,000 I bought from my sister. The other six came from my bank account. And I, and at the time I'm living paycheck to paycheck, wife and three kids. We weren't in position for me to pull $6,000 out of my account. But yeah. I was at the point where, like, what do I do? Right. I got to keep going until I finish. I'm in I'm in too deep. And it really got bad to the point where my couple months of free lot rent ran out. And now the park owners hounded me for lot rent. Jeez. And she wants to know, like, you know, what's going on here? I thought you were going to be a couple of weeks and and that. And um, there were complaints from the tenants about my repair crew leaving a mess and working late and making noise and all kind of stuff. And it was just a nightmare. I'm um, thinking back at it. And um, so what ends up happening, <laughs> what ends up happening is just to stop the bleeding and cut my losses. I ended up selling it, uh, trying to get my, you know, whatever money I could get back out of it. And um, it needed so much work to be finished that I ended up selling it for $2,000. Jeez. So I'm 11,000 in. I sold it for 2,000. So you guys can do the math. I lost nine. Oh. On the deal. Um, I still owed my sister five, right? So I ended up having to pay her back on payments, uh, you know, until I could get her money back. I had to go to my wife and explain to her where the other six thousand dollars went. And what oh happened. no! Yeah, so it was it was a complete nightmare, right? And I, I just really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but for me, I'm the type of person. I mean, I'm too stupid to quit to know when it's time to give it up. And I always kind of see things like from the other from the other uh, angle. I looked at it and I said, you know, one person would say, you know what, just quit, do something else. But what I saw in it is, wait a minute. OK, I know this didn't work out and I know this looks bad, but there are park owners that will work with you. There are free mobile homes out there. There are park owners that will allow you to fix and flip and, 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 and do that. Um, I totally looked at it as what went wrong was I had no idea what I was doing. Right. I had I didn't vet my handyman. Um, if I could go back in time and do it different, I would have probably connected with someone else in my area that has already done it and maybe yeah. went in on a deal until I could learn. And, you know, and, and it's all hindsight. Um, but the one thing that I did know is that I could tell that there was a demand for affordable housing. And that was way back when. Right. Oh. Um, and it's even more today. But. So that, that kind of kept me interested, um, and I still – I wanted to get back into the game, but fix and flip for right now wasn't wasn't my thing. Right. So you asked me, you know, before, like, how did I get into wholesaling? Um, as I was looking at it and trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do here? Right? I got I, – this 9 to 5 thing isn't for me. 
you know, I could tell, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I got to find a way out. Um, mobile home seems to have a lot of potential. I know I screwed this deal up, but I started asking myself questions like, if I were to get back into mobile homes, like how could I do this with little to no money? Right. Yeah. And as I started like an entrepreneur, as you start asking yourself questions, you start looking for answers. The answer came to me in, in, in thinking back of that, that real estate meetup I went to a couple of years previous, right? When that guy was talking about flipping properties with no money out of pocket, yeah, using a signable purchase agreement and all that stuff. And I was like, hmm. You know, some to this. I maybe yeah. I can tie this into the mobile <laughs> I home. Side. Tell my wife I found a solution, right? And she doesn't want to hear it. Yeah. And so I said, but no, I found a way to do this with no money down and, and all that. So basically what it came to is like if I do what I think I'm 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 looking at doing, this is that whole wholesaling thing that guy was talking about. Yeah. But the question was back then in 2010 or 2000, actually it's 2013 at the time, um, is can you wholesale mobile homes? Sure. Right? Because at the time, all, all I saw, at least in my area, I didn't know anybody that was doing it. I Everyone that was wholesaling was wholesaling single family houses. Sure. Right. We buy ugly houses and all that stuff. And so that was a question. Can you wholesale a mobile home? And so I took 2013 and I pivoted to wholesaling. Um, I was able to get, I would say, I think I got like two or three homes under contract. Um you know, trying to figure this thing out. I was never able to flip those deals. Yeah. Uh, looking back now, it's because I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't know how to evaluate a deal. I didn't know how to negotiate. I simply took any buyer that would sign, seller that would sign my contract, put their home in the market and slap the fee on top of it. And I thought yeah. that's how you did it. Right. So, so yeah. Kevin, let me, let me pause you here real quick. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that number one, you bumped your head a lot. Okay. You, but most importantly, you kept going with it, right? So you figured out different ways to handle it. You found wholesaling as a different route to go versus having to buy and put the money in. And what I want to talk about here, and, and thank you for giving us that background because it, it, it just goes to show now you're cranking and, made, and doing a lot of wholesale deals, but you didn't start out that way. So no, people no, no. who, so people who are getting into real estate or mobile home, you know, mobile home investing, whatever, um, they just need to stick with it and they need to get proper education. They have to understand what they're doing so they can skip all these head headaches and all these, you know, bumping your head and everything. What I want to talk about, okay. Cause that's super powerful is if someone is looking at, let's talk community owners real quick. I'm going to kind of swap back and forth. So everybody gets a ton of value out of this as a park owner in simple terms. What, what would you recommend I do to start sourcing homes off market? And, and obviously you wholesale homes, but you're doing acquisitions, right? So you're out finding deals. If I'm a mobile home park owner and I need to go fill some lots, where, where, what are a couple, um, high level strategies. What are a couple of things that you do to, to find these mobile homes that can be brought in? And Hey, one other thing before you answer that guys, drop your questions in the comments, make sure you drop them in the comments. We will answer them live here. I already got a few coming in. So, um, Khalid dropped one, uh, actually two. So yeah, just drop them in the comments. We will get them answered. Just stick around. Go ahead, Calvin. So as a, as a community owner, and I want to fill up lots, What's a couple of quick strategies or places that I should be looking to? There's another question. Thank you. Keep the questions coming, guys. Um, where should I be looking for these homes? I mean, to me, I, I would say probably, you know, you can market. You can do, you can advertise that you're looking to buy mobile homes, whether okay. you're posting in Facebook groups or you're taking out Facebook ads or Google ads, whatever you're doing. But honestly, for me, um, there's two ways that you can you can generate leads, right? Either through marketing and through networking. Right. Yeah. So marketing, you're advertising for inbound leads. But I would say if I was a park owner, I, I think I would lean more on the networking side and building relationships. And, and the one thing, if I had to uh, if, I, if I could give one uh, tip, I would connect with the mobile home dealers in the area. Right. Um, That's one of the and, and it's something that I actually do to help source leads for park owners that I work with. And and what I do is I connect with mobile home dealers. Um and, I, and I, I connect with their sales team and I become a resource for them and their clients. Right. Yep. 
So typical situation is a mobile home dealer is selling a new mobile home to a client, right? That when they don't want to buy a new home, most of these guys, almost like car dealers, right? Car dealer uh, salespeople, you've got clients that come in, they want to buy a new car, but they're coming in with their used car and they're trying to see how much they can get for a trade in. Right? Yeah. Same thing with mobile homes. So what I figured out uh, years ago was most of these mobile home dealers are not interested in the used market, right? Um, some do, but most of them are not. They're there to sell new mobile homes. Yeah, it's so, easy, right? <laughs> yeah, and if they take a use, if they take a trade in, um, if, if that's the way, if that's the only way to make the sale go through, and they got to take it in, they're going to do it. But they prefer not to because it becomes more of a hassle for them. To one, they've got to send their crew over there to break that home down and pull it over to the lot, right? So there goes a whole day's work, and you know it's time and money to do it. And then they got to sell that home. So whether it's marketing it, getting a bunch of people asking questions, it probably needs some work. And that's not really their game. They're here they're yeah. to sell new mobile homes. So store it. They're doing it out <laughs> in the, they got to store it. It's taking yeah. up space at the dealership. So what I figured out is if I could find a way to step in and intercept that intercept that transaction. Um, so I actually contact mobile home dealers and I tell them that we're looking for tons of use, you know, single lots. Yeah. And I'm looking to connect with their clients that are looking to buy new, but have to sell used in order to have money for a down payment and to have their used home move so they can make room for the new one. And so that's Love basically, it. you know, that's one hustle that I do. I contact, they now, a lot of the dealers, especially like in my area, they'll call me. I got two leads today, you know, before we got online from a local dealer, um, they send me leads and say, Hey, I've got another one for you. Right. And it's that situation. Um, I'm going to contact the seller and I'm going to make them a cash offer uh, for their home. Now, typically our cash offers are equal to or greater than a trade-in value. Yeah. Right? So if you think about it this way, you've got a client that if they trade it in, they're just going to get trade-in value, right? So maybe maybe the dealer is going to give them 3000 for their mobile home. But what if I could offer them five, right? Yeah. And what if I've got a, a cash buyer rating waiting at eight to 10000 you know, and they're willing to, to, to buy it. And I'm able to make me, you know, maybe I can make $5,000 in a quick transaction. So what I do is I solve the seller's problem, right? They now have the money they need for the down payment that they would have got on a trade-in. Plus they walk away with a couple thousand in pocket by dealing with me. My investor partner gets another property, right? And they're going to pick it up for cheap and rehab it and fill a vacant lot in their park. Which, yeah, I was just going to say that investor a lot of times is the mobile home park owners that are filling yes. up lots, right? That's like one of your biggest clients that you sell homes to is mobile home park owners because they're a sure thing. They got the money. They know they're where it's the going. All behind, that, right? They're the we behind we buy mobile homes for me, <laughs> right? They're the cash yeah. behind it. They're the quick cash offer. So I'm able to provide value to that client, right? They're able to get into their new home. Well, for the dealership, they don't have to mess with that move. Yeah. They don't have to mess with that home. And, and then they can move forward with the sale of the new home. So they're going to get paid on the back end. So they're not worried about my assignment fee and what I'm going to make off of it. Right. Um, in fact, most of them will tell me what the trade in value is. Sure. Just so you know, we offered them 4K. Here's nice. their number. So if I come <laughs> in at five or six, I'm ahead of the game. You know what I mean? And we can make a good deal. And it's really a win-win plus the moving company that's going to move the home for the park owner is going to win too, you know, so everybody gets a piece of the pie, but that's, I would say if I was a park owner, I would, that would be a great way to connect with your mobile, mobile home dealer. Super, super actionable, actionable information here, guys. You know, it, as a community owner for us, we buy new, but we also try and buy used and it's, time consuming to source those deals. And so, yeah, I like your strategy of creating inbound leads through referral systems like that. That's a lot less um, labor intense, capital intense, all that than like marketing to get, to get homes from retail sellers directly. So I love that. Now, how we, as a wholesaler, you're basically tying up the home on a contract, and then you're selling that contract to an end buyer. You keep the spread, right? Or you you get your yep. assignment fee as the spread. Well, as a as a um, as a community owner, 
for me to go and find, and hey guys, make sure you're dropping your questions in the comments. We are going to answer them. I've got a bunch of them, so we're going to start answering them, kind of like pause, answer, and then keep talking. But um, uh, I mean, for me, I would much rather not have to focus on that. And so we have successfully worked with wholesalers who are doing probably that strategy and others, but on a very large scale, that bringing us homes. And so for us, that margin of an extra 5,000 or whatever it is still makes a lot of sense because I'm getting a used home at a great price. I didn't have to go find it and it's consistent lead flow for us. So that allows the wholesaler to go out and do their thing and it allows us to go focus on the community side. So I just want to point that out because you can go do this yourself or you can work with people like Kelvin who actually wholesale them to you and uh, everybody wins. So let's talk a little bit about um, how, if, if you're a park owner, okay, and you want to find, other, hold on, remind remind me, I, ha I had that question for you, but I want to make sure I get to some of these before people get distracted. Uh, hey, Calvin, do you also invest in mobile homes for passive income or do you only strictly wholesale? Yes. Yeah, so at the moment I, I strictly wholesale. That's, that's, that's what I'm doing. Can now, you, my can long you... term, I do believe in cash flow. My long term is I'm actively looking for parks. That's where, that's kind of the, the, the end game. I want to be like Mario. <laughs> <laughs> and you will. So, um, so that's a really great point too. The wholesaling of homes is a great way to build up cash to then turn around and invest it in parks. I love that. <clears throat> great question, Cleed. Uh, here's another one. How much ha has the industry changed since you got to start? Has it changed much? I mean, it's it's become definitely become more popular, both on the home and the park side. You can see um, a lot more interest, even in the last three years. I've seen I've seen a lot of that. Um, I can tell you this. I mean, even with parks as well, I can I've seen a lot of transition from from people that were just flipping houses that are now like cashing in and buying mobile home parks and getting into that side of it. So I would say that's probably probably the biggest change is there's more people in, you know, well, you're part involved. of the problem, right? Because you're actually teaching people how to do this too. So <laughs> you both you and I are both the problem. You're teaching them how to do the home side and I'm teaching them how to do the park side. So we're kind of creating creating the buzz. But at the same time, it also makes efficiencies. It makes good industry best practices. So there's good that comes from that too. Um, all right, cool. Somebody said, hey, guys, from South Carolina. All right, um, who moves the homes? Yes. Yeah, so typically uh, when I'm wholesaling a deal, it's the buyer that's going to be responsible for the move, whether it's a park owner, an investor, that's the buyer. Or in some cases, um, it, it could be a consumer buyer that's going to live in the home. I would say that's probably one of the most unique differences between wholesaling single family houses and mobile homes. With single family houses, typically you're going right to the cash buyer, right? Investor only. I don't know how many people wholesale single family homes to consumer buyers. They're going to fix it up. But in the mobile home game, it's different. You, you've got a market on both sides yeah. um, where you can flip. But even if it's a consumer buyer, they're responsible for the move and the moving costs. I, I agree. And, and I would say that a lot of mobile homeowners are interested in buying kind of handyman specials that they're going to move in. A lot of, a lot of people that live in mobile homes, mobile home parks, whatever are definitely blue collar. They work in the trades and they're handy. They got buddies who are handy. They got access to materials, things like that. And so they're like, boom, I know how to fix this up. I do it on houses all day, every day. So they fix up their own home and create equity and all that. Um, follow up question is Kelvin's team nationwide. Yes. And we're always looking to grow and expand. So I do. I've got a, a team of three or four students that are on my immediate team. It's myself. So there's five, and then my VA. I have a, I have a virtual assistant. So there's six of us. But in addition to that, I also I have like I've got a couple hundred students from all over the country, different states. So I'm able to through relationship, I'm able to you know expand into other markets and do deals that way. Yeah. So you're doing whole, you're wholesaling homes all around the country, but you're also doing JVs too, yeah. right? So you're joint venturing with other people who want to wholesale homes in their market. You you'll teach them, but you also joint venture with them as well. Um, somebody said, Hey, Hey, <laughs> uh, well, here's another one. Calvin, keep me in mind. If you come across units near 
Macon County, South Carolina. We need 19 units for infill. Love it, dude. I'm telling we you, just you're gonna get a deal in a couple last month, a double lot. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, you're gonna get a bunch of park owners that are watching this that are gonna be hitting you up wanting to buy homes off you. Just make sure I get first dibs, okay? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I call I call for his dev, so I'm kidding. Um, all right, but hey, um, just so you know, whoever posted that, we don't have a name, but Calvin's gonna give his contact info at the end and how you can get a hold of him and how you can do business with him. So stick around so that you can uh, connect with him and make sure that uh, you guys start doing some deals together. I love it. So my question was, if I'm a park owner and I want to start like buying homes to bring into my communities, how can I go and network with guys like you wholesalers? Like what, how would, where would you find them? How, how would the approach be? What's kind of that look like? Honestly, I would say, I mean, you kill somebody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, uh, look, Facebook groups, right. Just like we're in right now, uh, you know, using social media. Um, so I, I do like, for example, I have a Facebook group and it's a, it's a free, you know, uh, forum, uh, that connects uh, we've got over, almost 15,000 uh, members nationwide that do several things, but in that group and other groups like it, uh, you can connect with a lot of, uh, we call our, we refer to ourselves as mobile home specialists. That's kind of the term we use, right? Where we're kind of a, a one-stop shop for a park owner. Um, when I, you know, I did my, I told you I was doing this as a side hustle to my full-time job. And until about in two, let's see, 2014 till 2017, is when I did my first deal with a park owner, right? Other than that, I was dealing with homeowners and that's a grind, right? Yeah. Um, and I didn't know any better. I mean, that's just that's just what I knew. But I did my first deal with a park owner and that was game changing. And I learned so much from them. Um, now my business model is based around solving three problems for a park owner, right? And that's vacancies, abandonment and evictions, right? And that's, as I, as I started to work with this one park owner and his brother, they owned... At the time, I think they owned like two or three parks in Louisiana. I think they own maybe 10 or 12 now. Um, so that was that was years ago. But I, I saw it quickly. I was like, wow, like it's it was so much easier to work with a park owner. Um, yeah. You know, as far as it's, it's a business transaction. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Let me point something out. You're giving good nuggets here. I just got to make sure people are catching this because you're dropping them fast. Be easy to work with. <laughs> <laughs> be be professional and be easy to work with with these guys. These guys are doing a bunch of volume and they're going to work with the guys that are sure things that are going to come through and that they're easy to deal with. Otherwise, they're going to sell it to the next guy who because cash is king, right? So I, I should actually say cash is really a commodity in this situation because there's other park owners coming to the table that have cash. So be easy to work with, perform the way you say you are so then you can keep getting those leads. Otherwise, they're going to go to the guy who is. Keep going. Yeah. And that's what I saw. I mean, I saw that um, what I learned and, and, and then moving forward and dealing with more park owners and this is nationwide. It's the same thing. Right. And you can I'm sure you can vouch for this. These park owners, you know, as far as acquiring parks, the, the park side of it, they get really good at finding deals. They get good at building teams. They get good at learning how to operate these parks and improve them and everything, financing, all this stuff. The one thing that that's a sticking point is the infill, right? Totally. Filling up these these lots. So I saw a lot of opportunity there. I like how easy the transaction was with working with these guys and how transparent I was able to be with working with someone that's like minded. Right. Yeah. Um, they want me to make money. Right. If I make money, they make money and they see it that way. So it's a business transaction. And I saw it. I was like, you know what? And not only not only is it ease the ease of transaction, but it's it's the the need for more homes. Yeah. So I could maybe I'm streamline, familiar. right? This guy just bought a park, he's got 80 lots and there's 20 vacancies. Yeah. So if I can find him a deal that fits his buyer box, guess what? I have an option. I can go out there and find 20 deals and have to go shop into 20 different buyers on marketplace and do it. Look at this. Hold, hold on. Curtis just dropped in the chat in the chat. Um, if you guys, if you guys don't know, you got to put your name. Otherwise, if you're on Facebook, I can't see your name. I only see names coming in from YouTube, but he said, we need 40 homes for infill in, uh, North Carolina. There just blasted his contact info all over the place. But yeah, it's right there, 20 something homes, one or 40 homes, I should say one buyer. So I got, right? I, I have to deal with one person, right? To sell you know 40 I mean? homes to Curtis. Yep. 
And then we were able to create a process and, and, and create some alignment. You know, I was be, I was able to be open and transparent about what my goals were and they were the same and it just made a match. So that's really what um, I ended up actually leaving, uh, jumping into this full time in 2018 after connecting with that park owner. And that's really what convinced me that, you know what, there's other people like them. You know, <laughs> you get 19 homes right there, Aiken. So, like, that's what I'm saying, dude. You're in the right spot. You're gonna be selling homes for years off this one. <laughs> well, that's not that the problem is keeping up with the demand now. Yeah, it's like exactly. It's flipped, it's flipped right? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I definitely, I definitely prefer working with park owners for sure. Love it. Hey, um, real quick, let's talk about kind of quick analysis for those who are looking to actually value a home to determine to buy it. Like in the park world, we're always looking at lot rent value, but we typically look at a shell value for a home. If we get a home with our park, we're kind of like, yeah, we really don't want to put a value on it. But if we have to, it's pretty much what we can sell it for quickly, right? So we're not we're not in the business typically of trying to max out the value of those homes and make a big spread. We want the lot rent. So putting on our invest, mobile home investor hat, how do you go about figuring out what these homes can sell for, especially retail? Because keep in mind, we're talking now, we're not trying to wholesale it. We're trying to retail it to somebody in our community. How would you recommend we figure out what we can sell that home for? I'll be honest. I don't know. Right? <laughs> so the so so on the wholesale side, one of the things that people ask me yeah. is, uh, like, how do you make your offers? And how do you know what to offer to the seller so it makes sense that you can flip it? And how do you value mobile homes and how do you run comps and figure out ARV and all that stuff? I spent years trying to figure that out, right? Bumping my head on the wall, trying to figure it out. And there's just, it's not, a, it's not an exact science because by the time I thought I had to figure it out, I met another park owner that saw it completely different. Right. Sure. And, and so what, what I eventually learned was in order to wholesale, it's not my responsibility to figure out the value of the home. It's my responsibility to figure out how the park owner sees it and they're my buyer. So I'm making offers based off of what they're willing to pay. And Got I it. Out, you know, and I'm just connecting you, with them. You just, you just like, sold another sure. 15 homes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so really what you're telling me is you got smart and you just figured out what your end buyer was going to pay and you back into it. Love yeah. it. So you figure out who wants what, what they can pay, then you go find the product and make sure you're you create a spread there. Right. And and the other thing too, the reason why I and I know I know there's always that debate in wholesale, regardless of the asset classes, buyer first or seller first. Yeah. So you got the debate where someone says if you find a good deal, the buyers will show up. It's true, right? But especially for newbies, when you don't know what a good deal looks like, that can be challenging. And so my biggest thing is, is, is aside from just providing value to the park owner, to the end buyer, I've got an obligation to the seller as well. So what I didn't want to do is become that guy that goes around and ties up a bunch of properties with no buyer in sight. And yep. then I have an escape clause in my contract that, le that allows me to escape with no, no scars, right? But I still right. left the seller in a bind because I was unable to perform. So for me, I kind of reverse engineered it. I do it backwards where most of the time I've already got my end buyer in mind. Yeah. There are some deals that don't fit my buyer's criteria. So we got to take another route and that's the ones that end up on marketplace. And we're looking for buyers that way, uh, which is a grind. But if I have my buyers lined up and I tell that seller, you know, not only does it help the seller because I've got a serious buyer, but it also gives me leverage when I'm negotiating. If I can tell a seller, listen, I know you're looking I know my offer is not quite what you were looking for, right? Here's all the reasons why. Um, but if we can make those numbers work, we can close in the next 48 hours. Yep. You know, and now it's like the convenience of time, the leverage where they're considering it now because they really want to get this deal sold. And I know I've got the partners behind me to, you know, to back me up on it. They're willing to give you 24 hours or 48 hours to perform because it's like, ah, what do I have to risk? 48 hours, but when it's like 30 days or 15 days. Now you're asking for real commitment from them. Hey guys, drop with no guarantee that 30 too. days, you know, that it'll still be sold because we're just yeah crossing our fingers. Right. Right. Hey guys, drop your questions in the comments so we can make sure to answer. And we've had some great questions up to this point. So you really, you're backing into it. And for all, can I, I want to point something out here because there are people that watch this 
that are in other types of real estate investments, even single family homes. And it's a great strategy with all property types, not just homes. If you can line up your buyers and make sure that you have a gauge on timelines and pricing, that's way better than tying it up and then going and finding somebody and hoping you can find somebody. So you've got a great buyer's list. You know your buyers, you know the ones that perform. That's why I was saying, right. be sure that when you say you're going to perform, you perform. So Calvin brings more. Um, otherwise, as soon as you don't perform, you're dead. You know, like you'll never get another deal. Hey, you just got a question popping up here. Do you always get the title or use a bill of sale? Um, let's see if I understand that question. Like, do I do deals on just a bill of sale only where, there, where there's no title? I have. Um, obviously, if there's a title, that's that's the preferred situation. But there are some times where um, mobile homes are kind of weird. And like like they'll change ownership three or four times and no one has the title when their original owner's deceased, you know, or nowhere to be found um, or someone just abandoned a home in the park. And there are some times where a bill of sale is the only way. But I would definitely suggest, you know, doing deals with the title. Yeah, we own a mobile home title company title processing company because we couldn't deal with third party companies trying to do the title work. So we just started a company that offers it to the public too. But yeah, so we do mobile home titles and I will tell you right now, he is so right. Mobile home titles are so quirky. There's so many different angles. Every County, every state is different and they're just a freaking mess. And so, uh, yeah, if you can get that title up front, get it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, I work with, uh, there, uh, you know, and I get to know like a lot of the auto title companies in my area. Yeah. Where they have been a great resource for me over the years, solving all these problems and just help helping me navigate through it. It's been, it's been some interesting situations. <laughs> I got another question popping up here. Do you deal with RVs too? So I have not personally, I'm open to it. I actually, I've, I've had a couple motor homes and, and RVs that I've tried to wholesale with no luck. Um, so it's not something that I do, but I'd be, I'd be open to it. So I'm typically, you know, just mobile homes. Yeah. Calvin, maybe you would agree with this, but I think RVs are definitely a different angle because you're dealing with a retail buyer. Chances are you're not dealing with a park owner because park owners right. typically don't buy RVs, bring them in and sell them. So you're dealing with a totally different buyer profile, most likely retail versus like yeah, Calvin yeah, is definitely. saying he sells to, um, investors, or I should say park owners that are infilling their lots. So it's just, he's got a constant buy box there that he can work within. So great question though. Super good question. RVs are quirky too. <laughs> um, agreed. All right. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit. What is the biggest mistake that a community owner needs to think about or avoid when they're picking up homes through a, through a wholesaler, like how can they get screwed? How can they, how can they get lose? Their, how, how can they, what mistakes can be made or how can they get screwed when working with a wholesaler? And or I guess, even just uh, a direct seller, just even a direct seller too. doesn't even have the wholesaler. Wow. So ways that a parker and it could find themselves in a bad position when, when, yep. when buying these homes, um, Maybe, maybe, um, I don't, depending on their process, I mean, if they're working with like sometimes park owners, and, and I've heard this, like sometimes park owners will work with uh, the process is that they're going to look at the home themselves, or they've got a handyman or a park manager that's going to be their boots in the ground and actually do a physical inspection. Uh, but if you're doing this and you're just relying on that wholesaler's opinion on that home, I've seen park owners get in trouble where that home doesn't turn out to be what they were told. Right. So if you don't, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't have, you know, someone that you can trust, someone that you can vet or your own personnel, you know, that that can look at it. Um, then that's something I've seen some park owners get themselves in the bad, that bad situation. So. so the lesson is inspect the home yourself or a trusted person on your team. Go inspect it. Don't take a wholesaler's word for it. Probably also don't take a seller's word for it, right? Yeah. Just because you're dealing with a seller, don't just go send the, the transport company, inspect it first, then buy it. So that's a great, great point. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So be thorough. Um, obviously get the title. Well, let me say this too, Mario. And it's not saying that the, the wholesaler or the person that you were dealing with was uh, 
was a rotten person. Sometimes no. what your opinion and their opinion is different, right? You know, this is a solid home, but what's solid to you and solid to me may be two different things. So I always recommend clean. to my buyers to have, you know, have someone that's available to go look at it. You know, um, and I've done some deals where this where the park owner just kind of took a chance and they ended up with the home and it needed more work than they thought it was. Yeah. You know, but I but I always suggest that they have someone to look at it physically. Yeah, it's just simple due diligence to make sure because you might, you know, Calvin might be like, man, it's clean, but define clean, right? Like, you know, or it's it's fixed, you know, it doesn't need anything. Well, define that. Like it might be going into one community where you've got very picky people versus a community. It's not do we're getting more questions. Let me drop these real quick. All right. Um uh, Nathan said, Do you wholesale many homes that are less than five years old, or are they all mostly older homes? Good yeah, question. five years is probably max. Like when, as far as being able to wholesale and make a profit, and I'll tell you why. Typically, that's a good question. Typically, that that seller still has a note on it yeah. when it's less than five years old. So, and and unfortunately, and you deal with this, you're gonna if you guys get into this, you're you're gonna deal with this, and you feel bad for them. A lot of these sellers are upside down. They're they owe way more than that home is worth, and then it has to be moved on top of it. You know, so they find themselves in bad positions and it makes it, it makes it really tough. Uh, so most of them are, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 years or, or older, you know, that, yep. that we're wholesaling because it's tough to make a deal. And it probably makes it harder to negotiate a low price when dude just they bought can it negotiate. four years ago. Some of them ago. are really, uh, really distressed situations, yeah. but they would negotiate if they could, but there's a note on it. So yeah. they, there's no wiggle room there. Um, and the other thing too is like you're not so no one's walking around with 60k in their pocket to buy this 2018 mobile home that's you know the seller has a mortgage on that's the payout right the people that are walking around with cash in their pocket are investors and they're looking for deals you know if they're going to spend 60,000 they're going to go to the dealership and buy a brand new one and have it delivered and set up um but and even or more now today I guess but um yeah it's hard to make deals out of those yeah, and their expectations are high because they just paid seventy thousand for it three years ago. So they kind of have an idea of the value. But when you when you are dealing with a home that's 10, 15 years old, they're like, I don't even know what this thing is worth. I'm done with it. Whatever, it's paid off. There, there's a it's a lot less clear on value too, right? So yeah. totally the loan, the debt side of it can be a killer. I get another question. Um, can your title processing assist me in North Carolina? Yeah, go to um uh celebrate mh title.com and uh yeah we can help you with that celebrate mh title.com cool um so all right got it so great questions by the way guys um kind of wrapping up here and get it giving everybody some last minute value here um if i wanted to work with someone like you how does that arrangement usually look? Is it like, what does that sound like? Is it a one-off kind of every deal is a little different? Do you kind of, how does that look? I mean, what I, what I try to do, I mean, I'm looking to do multiple deals with you. So my, my job is to become your eyes and ears. I'm looking to see what Mario thinks a good deal is. I need to know, like, that's all that matters. What is sure. Mario? Like, how do you run your numbers? And everyone's different. I've tried in the past to come up with like one formula that fit one fits all and there's no such thing. So yeah. if we're going to work together, then it's you and I sitting down and having a conversation. Mario, what does the last five deals you bought look like? You know, like what's your buyer's box? We're talking like and being clear on it, like your, your price point. If you tell me that, look, I want to be at 30K, you know, 35 tops, but, you know, 30K somewhere there. Well, what does that mean? You know, is that your purchase price? Is that moving costs included? Is that repairs? Is that my assignment fee wrapped in there? You know, and everyone's different. When someone, some one person says 30K, they're just looking at purchase price and my fee. The next sure. guy is all in, you know, you know, that's everything. So it's really just becoming clear on that. And once we can do that, I'm looking to do multiple deals with you. Yeah. And I think too, that also kind of shows us something. It shows us as community owners that if the person that's wholesaling to you 
whether I mean, if it might not be Kelvin, right? He might not have something in your area or whatever. But if you're working with a wholesaler and they're not asking you good questions and they're not thorough about trying to understand your buy box, it means they may not have a lot of experience because someone like Kelvin is trying to not waste time. He's doing a lot of volume. And so he's making sure that he's not wasting his time with you and he knows exactly what you're looking at. So he doesn't start bringing you duds, right? So kind of use that as a screening tool too. When you're talking to wholesalers, are they asking you those type of questions and trying to understand your buy box? Hey, we got another question. Um, what about foreclosed mobiles? Um, is it different finding foreclosed mobile homes than typical single family? So I really don't, I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't have a whole lot of experience with, with mobile homes, people that are being foreclosed on them. Um, they either, most of the, I mean, almost most of the deals are, are people that own them outright, you know, or they've got a high mortgage and I'm just unable, I mean, I hate to say, but I'm just unable to, to provide any value because they're just way, you know, upside down on it. Um, yeah. and I don't know what the solution is. Now I can tell you this, the home that you see behind me, we bought it on what I guess is popular today when people talk about subject to. <laughs> we actually bought this home and paid the, paying the note on it and renting it out in a park. You know, so I was able to 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 buy it with the existing mortgage in place. That's about the only solution that I could see that could help some of these guys that are over leveraged is maybe take, taking care of the note, but it's got to be the right seller. Yeah, you know, that's a good strategy good. actually. And just to quickly piggyback or, or give you some feedback, Nathan the foreclosure process on mobile homes is different. Um, so it's usually a lien process and then an auction. Um, so, but to, uh, it's going to be different in each state as well, but it's, it's more of a repossession of, a uh, with the note, like a car repo than it is a, a, a home foreclosure. So it doesn't go through the same process. Um, all right. We got another question. They're coming in fast. I'm new with MHP. What is the average price for a used home? Like what's kind of, what would you say down the middle? What's your average home that you're wholesaling to park owners? Just curious. Man, I used the number 30, you know, um, and there, man, every, everyone's different. I'm trying to think now because I've, as, a, as I'm thinking, everyone's a little bit different. I mean, one guy is okay with uh, older homes, late eighties, you know, early nineties. He's okay with that. They see it as, it's a 16 by 80 box. I'm going to get the same amount of rent for 1999 that a 2008 is going to give me. So they don't care. And the next guy is completely different. But I would say that most guys are buying, um, I don't know, maybe like they're look 10, maybe like 30 K seems to be the magic number all in, but that means that they're looking to buy it. They're looking, that's, that's the acquisition price. That's the moving cost repairs. They want to be all in at about 30. That seems to be the number, the magic spot for most invet, uh, park owners. And that's all throughout the Southeast, you know, with my, my experience. And so to be clear, when Calvin says 30, he's not saying buying it, his fee and the transport. He's talking everything, you know, transport, setup, any repairs. Because And the reason why he's saying that and why they're saying 30 is because there's a valuation on that lot rent that's happening, Okay. And that owner doesn't want to buy a home and sell it and break even and lose, or I shouldn't, shouldn't say break even, doesn't want to lose money. So if you buy a home and the lot rent is worth 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000 based on a cash flow um, valuation, a cap rate, right? Um, you don't want to pay more for the home than what that's going to be worth in your community because you're going to sell it. Let's say, even if you took a loss on that home, let's say you buy it for, um, let's say you're all in at 30. Okay. But you can only sell it for 28, but the cash flow, so you lose 2000 bucks, but the cash flow valuation on that is 50,000. Did you lose money? No, you made 20 K, right? So there's, that's what they're looking on the community owner side. They're looking, and, and that's why Kelvin is saying it's really hard to nail down a valuation from his standpoint because he doesn't know what their lot rent is in their community, what the cap rate is for that market. So everybody's coming to him saying, I'll pay this, I'll pay this, I'll pay this, because they're doing a similar calculation specific to their park. Okay. That's also a good thing for him because he doesn't have to worry about a retail price and, you know, doing comps. He just has to find out what they want and he goes and shops for it. So super good question, by the way, Baldwin. 
Um, so it's going to vary. I mean, we've bought homes for a few thousand dollars, older ones, and we've bought, you know, newer ones for quite a bit more in the tens of thousands. So I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but yeah, I, yeah, think I really put it right. on, the, on the buyer. Like, like there's tip two typical ways that I'm doing it. Either my buyer is going to go and look at the property or they'll send someone in and they'll come back. They won't talk to the, the seller about price. They're just there to evaluate. They'll come back and they'll tell me, man, I'll give you 28. If you can get the deal, make, make it work at 28. I'll wire the money tomorrow morning. Right? So for me, it doesn't matter what the seller's asking. I'm going to offer less than 28 to make my spread, right? And then wherever we fall, we fall. And yep. these are for park owners that don't want to negotiate. They're just going to come back and say, hey, man, I need to get it at 25 for it to make sense. Let me know. And then I'll go work yep. the deal. The other side is I've got park owners that are really good at negotiating and they prefer and they know they're good at it. So what they'll do is we'll work out a flat fee. So they know what my fee is. And they'll go in one on one with the seller and make the deal and they just keep my fee in mind. So there's two different ways, but most park owners will just give me the number and allow me to, to do the negotiating. Love it, dude. This has been a ton of value. Hey, Calvin's company is Mobile Home Wholesaling Academy, and he actually um, teaches people how to do this way more in depth. There's no way we could get into the how of all these things on a call like this. Um, and so, uh, oh, thanks, Paige. Appreciate it. Um, there is no way that, uh, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> I forgot to throw that out there. Subscribe. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no way we can like give all the hows of every step of this, but Kelvin does teach people how to do that. So Kelvin, what's, a, what's your website or where can they find that wholesaling academy? So the best way right now, because it's actually under construction, it should be launched actually by Friday. We'll have everything up and running. Um, we just kind of did a redo and rebranding, but the best way to reach me, honestly, you can email me and it's easy to remember the king of mobile homes at gmail.com. So you can email Not me there crazy. or you can just reach out to me on, on, on Facebook, you know, uh, what, for right now we have a private Academy, a private Facebook group. Was it the king of mobile homes at gmail.com? Dang, that's dope. All right. So, um, and then also he's got a Facebook group too. If you guys are into the mobile home side and you want to get into more of like wholesaling mobile homes and doing what he's doing, jump over to a uh, mobile home investing full time. It's a Facebook group that he runs and it's a big Facebook group. Like this is not a small group. He's got a very large group of people doing exactly what he's talking about. So check that out. And um, <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Super good stuff. If you guys want to buy mobile home parks, Go to um, getrealcashflow.com, getrealcashflow.com if you want to buy mobile homes, I'm sorry, mobile home parks, or just DM me the word learn on any of the social media platforms, the word learn. All right, Calvin, super solid, man. Appreciate your time. I know people lot of got, got a lot of value out of it. We're going to do more together. I'm confident yeah, of that. Absolutely. So, sell absolutely. me some homes, bro. Sell me some homes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, yeah, I'll drop this too real quick if you'll let me. If you guys want to uh, connect to, we're on Clubhouse. If you guys are familiar with the Clubhouse uh, drop-in audio app, um, we're on Clubhouse every Wednesday morning, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Central. And we hop on, guys, and we just connect with each other, you know, network. And uh, so definitely check us out there. Calvin's got like a big a big network. This is He's got a, like a big ecosystem of people doing this. So I highly recommend that if that's a world you want to be in in the mobile home side. So sweet, dude. All right. Thanks again. Appreciate guys, it, catch you later. Hi, right, guys. Peace.